Welcome back, everyone. I am very pleased to introduce our next panel to tackle the question of how digital and streaming storytelling will look in 2021. These panelists are extremely well placed to give us some of those answers. Let me introduce them to you. Joe Fibash is VP of Strategy and Media Solutions at The Weather Company. Glenn Hale is VP of Digital Content and Audience Development at Gray Television. John Kelly is Director of Data Journalism at ABC-owned television stations. Robert McKenzie is editor of BBC News Labs. And Emea Penze is supervising producer at CNN. Welcome to all of you. So this is a year in which we have been awash in critical data, particularly around the pandemic and the election. So John, you are one of the few people I'm aware of heading up data journalism at the station group level. How important is data journalism going to be in 2021? And what's it going to look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that 2020 um, provided somewhat of an elevation of hard facts, data, and the need for us to be able to, and the desire by viewers to be able to back up the reporting we're doing and add this layer of precision that you know is using source data and materials, original materials that help lend some authority to the information that's out there. And obviously in a moment, for instance, like the election that we've had and the racial reckoning that we've had and the COVID um, pandemic, it's been really important for stations, our stations, to have a handle on those numbers, to be able to show viewers our work, back up what we're reporting, help them understand a lot of the sea of information and frankly, the avalanche of misinformation that's flowing at them every day, really every hour, uh, so that they can better understand their world and make good decisions for their families. Um, I don't think that's going to let up in 2021. Um, we're going to, you know, be dealing with the pandemic issues for, you know, yet another year likely, and, and certainly new things will present themselves. The politics that we're living in locally at the state level and nationally are going to demand the same sort of authority that being able to get to the raw data and facts and share those and explain those to the audience is not only going to be something that viewers are looking for, I think it's going to be something that they expect from us. Mm -hmm. Really, really. Well, you're one of a handful, I think, only a handful of station groups are, are actually have someone in your position. Um, so for news organizations who to this point have only been toying with data journalism, if even that, what, what do they need to be doing in 2021? I mean, the thing that that is key is in is making the investment in, I think, having this capability in your organization. And if you're doing that centrally, that could be, a, you know, a, a data journalist or a couple of data journalists that are helping serve your broader station group. Uh, it could be more along the model of what we've done, where we've put a data journalist in each of our newsrooms and then we're working together as a unit to try to help evangelize and, and spread both the skill and the interest in using the resource. Um, but I think just start starting to take us take a step in that direction and really invest in having the capability to become part of your news gathering process is really um, is really the way to get into it. Does somebody have to own it in every newsroom? This is something I asked our keynote speaker yesterday, if that's if you have to have a point person designated, otherwise it sort of slips away perhaps. It has been a help for us in terms of the way that we've organized this, that in addition, in addition to a central team that's working together, you know, we're, we've got someone in each or more than someone now as we've expanded training and, and really worked with investigative teams and news teams on the skills to have that champion or two in each newsroom that can be the person that's in the news meeting raising a, a data opportunity with a breaking news story, some opportunity to add something exclusive that your competition isn't gonna have, a new wrinkle to a story, a revelatory data point. Um, mm. But having that in each of the newsrooms has been key to us being able to um, both 
make good out of the data journalism we're doing at each station, but then also pool those resources across the entire station group and even work with our network uh, partners at times on national pieces. Glenn, uh, Great Television launched OTT desks at each at all of its stations this year, I believe. In addition to its local streaming apps, it has an expansive partnership and an investment in the platform ViewIt. Potentially, that's a lot of locally originating streaming content. Um, I wonder what's going to be different about that content looking ahead to 2021. How are, are viewers going to see a difference in what streaming news content looks like locally? Well, first off, I think really there's been a, a change that was brought on by the pandemic um, that that really forced us into some things that maybe. Uh, we, we knew were true, but we weren't really forced to do until that happened. So uh, one of those being really lean production uh, and the ability to uh, go live easily and have resources at the finger the fingertips of, of uh, whoever is, is on camera. Uh, so that's one change. And then another change, uh, we're about to embark on a project um, to, to aggregate all of that local content. Uh, so we've got, you know, 94 different markets that we're in. And a lot of them are places that aren't necessarily, uh, they won't be on the nightly news uh, if you're looking at a national newscast. And so one of the things that we think there's an opportunity for is to get those stories and those voices that aren't necessarily seen every day uh, out front uh, in, a, in a broader way and not just in their local markets. And so um, uh, Local News Live, which is the initiative that we're building, uh, aims to do that and, and literally is, is based in the middle of the country in Omaha. So, uh, you know, we, we, we intentionally did that for, for the reason of, you know, being at a place where uh, not, it's not necessarily uh, viewed heavily uh, from uh, the traditional sources. So this is when you say aggregating, you're pulling stories then from across your 90 some odd markets and, and putting them into what a daily linear program or. Yeah, it's, it's going to be live streaming. Uh, we're going to have a, a team that aggregates those stories and then presents them a, a, a very heavy focus of that is going to be whatever's happening live. So, um, you know, for example, if something is happening live in, in Wichita, Kansas, we have a station there. Uh, we can pitch to that and then have that hosted by this team in Omaha. And then, uh, you know, in the middle of the thing in Wichita, maybe something else is happening in Burlington, Vermont, and we go there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea of that, especially with the scale that we've built, is uh, to, to get all of that out in front and to also just shine light on things that, you know, if you're, if you're, consuming just standard uh, newscasts from national sources, you, you may not ever hear those stories. Okay. Amaya, you work at on CNN's original streaming and digital video content. To what extent is that content now peeling away from the linear broadcast? And what are you doing in terms of experimentation, original programming or versioning that a viewer wouldn't otherwise see on your linear? Yeah, you know, at CNN, it's, it's not. We still lean into it quite heavily and it does very well for us. And oftentimes we're able to do a deeper dive on digital, uh, more profiles and better reporters in areas for longer, talk to people on the ground. So we have more time in digital um, than they would in linear, but it's all exciting and rewarding to take a story further. And I think on top of those efforts, we create original content, as you're saying, and are always experimenting new formats. Um, our ethos is always update, inform, and engage with our audience. And we'd like to create relationships with them and we'll continue to push on that. And I think that's what's really important um, in our space is interactivity and going live. Two examples I can just come up with right off the bat is one of the shows I oversee is Anderson Cooper Full Circle. And it's ironic before the pandemic, uh, Anderson was always on set on his AC360 set and we were tied to a control and we really wanted to break away from that and be a bit more casual and really center the show around Anderson's passions and interests. And as we were revamping the show, the pandemic happened and everybody was going home and uh, changing their look. And we thought this is perfect. Anderson will be in his, in his office. Um, and we were able to do a remote setup and it worked really well. And uh, we added an interactivity to it where we had audience members. We created a segment called um, Ask Anderson Almost Anything. We had uh, people 
uh, record themselves and ask Anderson a question that we play on the show. He wouldn't hear about the question beforehand, and he they would hear listen. He would listen to it and give his raw answer, and just lifting that veil and showing personality, which um, you can do more on digital um, than on linear. And on sec a second example I have is our show, Go There, where we have correspondents all over the world. Um, they usually, most correspondents on linear have to do two to three minute packages, and that's it. On Go There, you could do, we have a show where it's six to eight minutes, and they really, it's really POV. Um, it's very immersive. It's very to the camera. They take you with you to where they're going, and that we've seen just rewards on that. And they go live from places, and they're answering people's questions that they have instantaneously. So that's another thing that you can't do live that we're experimenting. And experimentation, like I said, is just huge for us. It's everything. And we're going to continue to do that. In the previous panel, I was asking uh, the panelists about story length and the sort of the latitude they have for, for how expansive those can be. Is that then, it sounds like with the, the second program you were talking about, that they're not quite shackled to a traditional runtime for a story. How, how, how elastic can those stories be? I mean, it depends on the topic. It depends on the content. And, you know, we found um, that viewers are sticking around for five minutes or longer to just watching uh, this content because they do feel a bit more immersed. They get to know the correspondent, the people they're talking to a bit more than they would in a quick hit uh, that people just uh, something that's digestible. And I mentioned also that with Anderson Cooper's show you're talking about, I believe that's the one that's shot entirely on mobile phones, correct? That, that's correct. Yeah, as all on mobile phones. And you know, it's funny because when the pandemic happened, you know, everybody was on Zoom. Instagram Live was was big. So we took those um, those uh, concepts and we kind of built that into a whole new look for a show where it looks completely mobile. Uh, there are no TV boxes at all. You know, just like Zoom, uh, uh, people go in and out. And um, that too, I think, spoke to a lot of viewers that it was just more relatable as to what's going on today. And um, I will say what I found is a big lesson, I think, in I think linear and also digital is that people are, don't really need the polish and they're more into authenticity. And we're able to pro provide that now. And I think that's a big lesson that we've learned. Mm -hmm. So, Robert, I want to flip over to you. Not everybody in this audience may be familiar with BBC News Labs. Can you just explain first what it is that you do there? Sure. So we're a collaboration between the engineering half of the BBC and the news editorial half. So uh, we have a combination of journalists, software engineers, UX designers, some product people, uh, data scientists, all mixed in together. And the idea is that we're there to drive the BBC's innovation um, and try and see you know, what the, the new audience experiences are and also what the new production techniques are for our journalists. Okay, so so much of your work there is focused on uh, news personalization. Practically speaking, what does that mean for a viewer? To to what extent are you able to customize an experience, and what does that actually look like? So at the moment, uh, customization is pretty minimal, in all honesty. Uh, so on the BBC News app, uh, you can choose to follow particular topics. So if you're particularly interested in your hometown or in coronavirus or uh, any other uh, of the, the, the topics the BBC covers, you can choose to follow that and you'll get a personalized feed uh, in, in, inside the news app. Uh, for our web users, uh, we are still very much at the experimentation stage, but we've got lots of uh, really interesting and exciting ideas because personalization can mean many different things. Uh, so personalization uh, is, is not just about um, content that you're interested in, it might be the style uh, in which we write about it. Uh, it might be the language in which we write it. The BBC uh, produces content in 42 different languages. Uh, it might be uh, just the, the, the format that we show it to. You might like videos, you might hate videos. You might wanna see uh, uh, stories done in a more kind of comic-like uh, structure, which is one of the things we've been experimenting with recently. You might want every story as a summary. Uh, you might love our traditional 800 word articles or long features. Now, personalization means so many different things to so many different people. And that's one of the things we are grappling with now is how do we produce the different varieties of content that are needed for that at a time when the BBC is trying to save money? Uh, right. And then how do we work out who wants what, uh, given that we're, we're reliant on a single BBC News website and a single BBC News app? So it sounds like personalization and versioning are sort of hand in hand then. Yeah, I think that's an absolute key. 
uh, is understanding that you need to make the best of what you've got. Uh, so there, if you, you cannot possibly, given the current economic climate, uh, go, go about making every individual version of a story that someone might want. So our answer is to bring some automation into that, uh, right. but not, not full automation. There's always a human in the loop. Uh, we're really uncomfortable with allowing a machine to dictate our editorial values. So everything that we do always has a human in the loop. So uh, one example might be our coverage of the UK election last year. Uh, so for the first time ever, uh, News Labs ran a, a pilot whereby uh, we use natural language generation software to produce a story for every single constituency in the UK. So 650 constituencies across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, and then on top of that, for the Welsh constituencies, for the fourth 40 Welsh constituencies, we also wrote that story in Welsh. So every single person in the UK got a story about who their new member of parliament was, what the result was, how that compared last time, were there any big swings, were there any trends, uh, all written with natural language generation uh, by a very simple form of AI, uh, and then checked very quickly by a human journalist before we published it. But actually that was just us being belt and braces because it was such an incredibly high profile thing for us. We didn't want right. anything with a, a mistake that we hadn't spotted going out, but we didn't spot a single mistake all night. So the machine was perfectly capable of generating those stories uh, on its own. It sounds a bit like what AP has been doing for a bit with uh, quarterly earnings reports for, for a lot of smaller companies and for minor league baseball, for instance. Is it not unlike that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very, very similar system uh, using very similar software, um, uh, but but kind of tweaking it slightly and, and, and trying to make sure that as a public service media company uh, that we are providing something that we think is really adding value, um, treating people as citizens uh, and, and not just as consumers, if that doesn't sound too arrogant. Uh, um, so, you know, really, really trying to add to, to the level of knowledge uh, amongst the population with, with what we're doing. And I want to try to come back to personalization, but one last quick thing about that is, is the end game here to also have personalization available on linear broadcasting or using um, uh, platforms like ATSC3 or Next Gen TV? Is that part of the ultimate goal? Possibly. So we work very closely with BBC R&D uh, and we're looking at how we can uh, use connected TVs to kind of mix up uh, traditional broadcast technologies uh, with, uh, with, with on-demand. Uh, so you could potentially be watching, say, the broadcast news coming over satellite or terrestrial broadcast networks. Uh, and then at a particular point, uh, a particular frame point, uh, you would seamlessly switch uh, to your Internet feed to get that personalized content and then back into the broadcast again. Um, we've been using it for trailers at the moment uh, rather than for editorial content, but it's something where yeah, we're in the very, very, very early stages of, of thinking about. Okay, well, we brought up AI just there. Uh, Joe, the weather company has a solution that uses AI to personalize weather reports for mobile users. Will that same technology serve streaming audiences at some point? And, and how do you see AI enhancing news or weather storytelling in the next couple of years? Right. Hey, Michael, um, thanks for the question. I, let me just take a step back and then I'll, I'll get to answer that question. Um, yeah, as everybody knows, the weather company does weather. We do it really, really well. It's the only thing we do. Um, and so we're able to go super, super deep. And we start with the absolute best and most accurate weather forecast in the world. And you know, we tend to lose sight of, of how hard that is to do and how much um, technology can really help with that. And with, with IBM's help, we've applied a lot of technology, super computer, computer technology, um, to make that actual forecast better. And it's getting better and better and better and better. And, and we're sort of widening the gap between us and others and that, which is a really important starting point. Uh, you, you take that, you, you add AI, as you mentioned, you add cloud, which we'll get to in a minute, I think as we go through uh, some of the questions in this panel, um, and, and you end up with some attributes that we are trying to build toward on the weather side, um, which are, Personalization, as, as we've mentioned before, and, and AI is a big part of that, but automation is a big part of it too, because we're all in business and the scalability 
of solutions is really important. And we, you know, humans are a very scarce resource and we wanna make sure that we do as much automation as possible within the bounds of that personalization. Distributed content is important. And we'll get into that more as we start talking about cloud, but um, the days of having production tied to an individual location, um, let alone an individual device are certainly over. And cloud is a huge part of that distributed aspect of things. But then it, it, at the very bottom of it, sort of the, the cherry on top is some form of branding or humanization or something that does separate, it give, gives everybody a chance to differentiate. You know, in the broadcast world, we are differentiating on the basis of human beings and, and we can't lose sight of that. And it's a, it's a massive differentiator and something that's really important. So. Um, let me circle back to what you ask. Um, Insight is the name of the, the product that you were referring to. Um, it, it takes 147 different um, aspects of weather and, and builds a set of rules for personalization that's different for, for each human or each individual. So it, it is constantly weighting and re-weighting factors in there. It could be the time of day, it could be the urgency um, it, it could be location. That's a very big uh, part of it. Uh, it could be the, the user's browsing history. Um, we now know that you're you know, interested in allergies or that you work out at six in the morning every morning. So you really wanna know what the temperature is gonna be. But, but that's the product that, that you're referring to um, called Insight, which really is kind of the first generation AI powered personalization. It is on mobile. And, and one of the things that I think we'll get to as we get um, deeper into the panel is the concepts, the technology, a, a lot of the aspects of, of Insight that currently lives on mobile will come over the television set. Um, it's a different beast, um, got to sort of build for it differently, uh, but, but that is what we're working on right now is bringing that level of, of AI-based personalization over to the television set. Okay, I want to talk about streaming or OTT, which is an acronym I think we may be dropping soon for a bit here. Um, audiences on streaming accelerated dramatically this year. They were obviously fueled by the pandemic. I know from practically every conversation I've had with a streaming executive at a news organization that uh, viewers watching OTT news gravitate overwhelmingly to the quote unquote live stream on a channel. I wonder how different should that stream be from what they'd see if they were otherwise flipping channels on linear? How different are the audience expectations? And Amaya and Glenn, I'd like you to both take that, please. Well, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think uh, in a lot of cases, the, the OTT audience, um, when, they're, when they're going through their devices and looking for something, they're not looking for, in my opinion, as much of a polished product as maybe they do when they're consuming traditional linear TV from a cable box or however else they get it. And so you, you, have, to, you have to plan for that differently and you have to loosen your approach. Um, you know, the, the project that we're working on that I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going into that with that in mind that, you know, if, if something is a little bit loose and if you're talking to somebody off camera and, you know, all those sorts of things that, you know, on traditional television may be considered no-nos, uh, on, on OTT, those types of production values are, are actually, they perform better uh, than, than linear television, traditional linear television in a way. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're working that into our plans because we know that audience and the way they consume things is a little bit different. What do you think, Amaya? Do we need some really differentiated content there? You know, I think it's a mix of both. As I said, you know, linear does well for us. Um, um, on streaming, you know, everyone loves to see Don and Chris talk to each other. Everyone loves to see Anderson and they just relate to them. And I also think that there's a lot of, there's a young audience that um, consumes content really differently. They don't always go linear. So sometimes it's good for them to see what linear is doing. But I do think having a mix is, is good uh, to, like I said, the experimentation factor. Um, you know, at CNN, we're investing so much of, you know, our, our of our 
you know, time into our relationships with our user. And we want to make sure that they get something that's casual and just, you know, off the cuff, which is what digital offers. Um, and additionally, you know, it's all about audience as well. You know, when I came to CNN, I was just floored by our global reach. And, you, and that alone, that global footprint is huge. And that's a differentiator in the marketplace. So um, I really think it's a, it's a mix of both. So, Joe, uh, what about differentiated streaming weather forecasts? I mean, can news organizations have expanded or differently versioned content there without it being too much of a strain on workflow? Because me meteorologists are, they're either on camera doing the linear broadcast or they're doing Facebook lives, they're on social a lot. So is that doable? Yeah, it, it, absolutely it is. I think there are two um, Number one, th there's a cloud part um, that's super important to free up resources and, and enable a much more flexible use of, of human resources. So um, we can have people partnering. You can have one person you know, on camera in the, in the studio and another person out live, and you can mix and match all of that much easier if you're in the cloud um, than you can if you're tied to, to on-prem. So we're rolling out the, the max on cloud um, the solution. And we think there's a lot of, of sort of workflow um, and collaboration use cases that are gonna be super helpful right out of the bat. But, but I think what we're really gonna find when we get a couple of months into it is people start to use, the customers start to use the tools in ways that we probably have never even thought of um, because it, we do need more flexibility and the COVID time was sort of a, a little trial run and certainly people were extremely creative um, in their uses of the technology. But if you put it all in the cloud, um, it can be even better and more flexible. So yes, I, I, I do think it's coming. Um, I think the, the sort of flexibility and distributed aspects of cloud is important. Um, but I think auto, smart automation is important too because weather is something that is really not that interesting if it's an hour ago. Um, and since humans are a, a scarce resource, um, if, if you're not able to automate content in a way that's attractive to make sort of real time videos um, that, that are completely relevant when and fresh when they come out, then you really haven't served the consumer very well. Glenn, and if I can just add something on that one. Sure. So I yeah, sure. So I think I, it might be interesting uh, for people watching to, to search for an experiment that BBC R&D did a little while ago called Forecaster, where they use this concept of object based media. So you essentially take everything to pieces so the, uh, the, the presenter is separated from the background, separated from the, 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 the subtitles and so forth. And they've done a very interesting experiment in, in Forecaster where they're able to serve up for different audiences a high contrast background for people who have visual disabilities, uh, subtitles for people with hearing difficulties, uh, for people uh, who particularly are interested in their local weather, the map zooms in on their, their particular local area. So, you know, this, this ability to, to break the forecast into its different objects uh, is also something that you can do with it, potentially with interactive TV. Oh, well, there's some serious personalization right there, potentially. Um, Glenn, you have talked in the past about uh, very granular local content on on local streaming channels, particularly kind of narrow audience events like high school sports matches um, when we eventually have them again, um, or very local kind of festivals or events um, around which a small but a viable audience can be aggregated. Is that still a workable idea? And and if so, how is that going to look next year at Gray's stations? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I think it is. And I, I think the key thing, uh, especially with the economics of, of OTT, and I agree with you that we should retire OTT as a term, uh, but uh, the, the economics of that being that, uh, you know, video advertising is obviously more valuable. And those niche products, uh, while they, there may not be a large number of people viewing them at any given time, the people who do view them will view them for 30 minutes an hour. Uh, and so if you get that kind of, of, um, uh, of time spent, uh, you can throw in some ad breaks in there and, and then suddenly it's a business. Um, so being able to take those things and, and, you know, aggregate them and also just expose them to audiences that may not have even known they were out there or available 
is a really key component to to our strategy. And you're talking about in other markets, like you did the Iditarod from Alaska and carried sure. it over. Sure. Uh, you know, we, we have stations in Hawaii and Alaska, and at any given time, there are things going on in both of those places that people in the in the mainland may not know about or all over the world may not know about, but they'd be really interested in because they are different. Um, and, and, and not just those places, but, um, you know, there are a multitude of events around holidays and and just things that are unique to some of our markets that you know, they aren't known outside of a 50 to 100 mile radius and, and maybe uh, additional exposure of those things. Uh, we're, we're banking on it. Additional exposure of those things will be um, a good business. That presents a discovery challenge, though, doesn't it? Because, I mean, you've got to, I guess, have a really good home screen with a really popping VOD kind of menu that um, that your viewers would even find that. Yeah, and that's part of where our partnership with Viewit, uh, which you, you referenced earlier, uh, Viewit has already been down the road of, of finding niche content and then putting it in channels so that people can easily consume it. And there's an evolution going on with their product as well. And, and you know, we're invested in that, in that product. So we're working hand in hand to identify those things and then make sure that they get in front of a larger audience. I want to come back to personalization, uh, starting with you, Rob. When you look at the BBC News in its entirety, there's this massive wealth of content to draw from, uh, potentially to create a very, down the road, a very highly personalized news product with all that material. But the more you localize from a news perspective geographically, um, that library gets narrow and narrow. So Yorkshire is not going to have, you know, if you're just dealing with local content, obviously you can't you don't have quite the same size of library. Um, for a news organization who wants to do this at a local level, how do you create something digitally for the consumer? When you're using the word personalized, how do you deliver on that promise and make the viewer feel like there is something that actually feels personalized to them? So I think there's a, a combination of ways that you can deal with that. So you know, at the, the first level, you can create more content, right? So the stuff we're talking about, you know, the stuff that AP does or the stuff that we did in the election with natural language generation. So you can start giving people a new angle on democracy by taking local uh, data on, I don't know, crime rates or uh, local garbage collection or whatever. And you can, you know, you can turn those into, into articles, um, either text uh, or using, uh, you know, um, uh, programs like Wibbits, you can turn that into, into video as well. So producing more content is one approach. Um, I think the other approach is being a lot smarter about how you think about the relevance of a story. So it doesn't always necessarily need to be about your location. It might be something that's relevant to you because of who you are, right? So you're a stay-at-home mum, you know, or you're a small business person. Or, you know, there's, there's many different groups. Uh, and, and so it's about thinking about personalization in a much wider context. So you know, what material does the BBC have for small business people based in Yorkshire? Well, not very much. But how much information does the BBC have about the economy in Yorkshire and about entrepreneurship, starting your own business, dealing with taxes, government policy uh, around incentives for R&D? There's huge amounts of content around that. So it's, it's really about understanding your content in very deep uh, ways, uh, which we're and, starting and understanding, to- just, Sorry, just to break in, understanding your audience too, having the data on them, having them share with you that level of granular information about themselves, right? To, in order to be able to serve it to them. Absolutely, and, 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 that, and that's precisely the point. You know, in order to do personalization, you need two things, right? So first of all, you need to understand your content properly. And secondly, you need to understand your audience properly. Uh, and if you don't have either of those things, you can't do personalization because you're not in a position to match up the interests between what you've got and what your audience wants. And that's the absolute key is understanding both of those things and then being able to do something about it, obviously. That's the personalization. Let me hear from the rest of you on this. Where, where right now are we seeing some level of personalization at your own organizations? What does it look like so far? Um, I mean, whether it's in terms of really focusing in on one part of the DMA or it's, um, it's, it's more, you know, based on audience subject identities like we were just talking about. What, what have you got so far? What do you think may be coming online for 21? 
So, I mean, we're using data to provide people with personalized experiences um, or, or hyper-localized experiences, um, similar to some of, of what BBC News Labs is talking about, you know, utilizing um, tools. We have one out today, for instance, it's, it's digital first because that's the platform that makes sense for it, but it allows people to put in information about themselves and where they live and tells them a little bit about where they can expect to be in the order for getting vaccinated for COVID-19. Extremely hyper-personalized information. Um, I think probably 2021's trick for us is, is figuring out how do we do things like that and make that work on a video platform, right? I mean, some things are more uh, keen for personalization. Uh, in a digital format. The other one that we did that is um, along these same lines that does have some video and, and streaming capability to it is, is a very, all the way down to the street level, live wildfires map in California, where people were able to zoom in and out in real time and see a combination of satellite on the ground data from firefighters, air quality monitors and other data down to their street level to get a sense of what was going on with the fires that were surrounding, particularly San Francisco and Fresno over the summer. Um, and being able to stream that on television or on linear or on, or on CTV has got some value, I think. How long did it take to build a tool like that? So that took, you know, a few weeks of development time for a few people. Um, but then, but then once it's done, it's, it just has to be maintained. Um, you know, and make sure that, you know, your data feeds aren't breaking down and, and things of that nature. Um, but, but there's some in, upfront investment, but then again, in that case, just on digital, that was, you know, tens of millions of, uh, unique visitors on digital. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody, anyone else have any nascent examples of personalization they can share? Sure. Um, I, I, we talked about Insight, um, which is one product. There's a, another product that Glenn's very familiar with called Engage. And this is a different kind of personalization. So, so this is, it's sort of, I would say probably more mass customization than you know, individual personalization, but it's a good combination of, of automation and sort of humanizing slash branding. So the, the way it works is the Mets in, in each station determine um, what set of circumstances in what location they want automated content to be built for automatically. So if there's a tornado on Main Street, then you know we want the following cards of weather information um, to be built. Uh, they're, they're then notified whenever that confluence happens and they're given the opportunity to put a human on top of it. So they have a button that says, you know, click here to, to create a video and their webcam comes on and they can talk about that, that automated content and provide sort of that branding and that human touch to it. And then they click another button and it goes out only to the people that they think would be interested in it based on their location or interests. So it, it's, it's not, you know, I get something and somebody else gets something completely different, but it's a combination of automation and customization and humanization that I think is a really good example of where this is going. Yeah, I'll, I I'll jump in there and, and agree with Joe that that's been a pretty key component to our video strategy at Gray is, is making use of those and finding the right combination between automation and things that are fronted by our meteorologists. And, you know, both of those things have been really important and we've, we've grown video pretty significantly on those platforms. Let me flip subjects to remote production. Um, the, the remote production conditions of 2020 introduced viewers to reporters and anchors uh, in much more personal settings than uh, viewers had seen before uh, and, and has, has come up a few times. It's changed our collective expectations for what news video content can, can look like. Uh, in fact, I think we have a slide we can maybe show of some some meteorologists doing some some uh, work from their homes. Yeah, we've got that there. Um, I wonder what all of you think about how that's going to impact the longer term look and feel of news stories on the other side of the pandemic. Are we gonna see some fairly radically permanently different, um, more casual or perhaps more, I might call it more authentic view 
of reporters in situ? And anybody can jump in on that. I, I think you're going to see more authentic um, and, and also more casual. And I also think that, uh, you know, the, the things that there were just crutches that we had always relied upon. Uh, things that were we we had these these you know extravagant expenses for various things that we just you know this situation has proven that a lot of that stuff isn't absolutely necessary now it's necessary in some context for certain things but um, you know in a lot of ways the, the people at our stations um, you know while they would love to be uh, able to be all together again. Uh, from a production standpoint, they've gotten into a groove. Um, you know, we've, we've got a, speaking of meteorologists, we've got one who does pretty much everything from his backyard. Uh, I mean, everything. He's got a nice backyard and the viewers have, have latched on to his nice backyard and they now expect that backyard whenever they see him. And so, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of context there for uh, things that are gonna continue uh, well beyond what, what's going on now. So a good backyard's okay. Maybe a shabby apartment, less so. Too many cats, maybe not the best that's idea. Why, that's why half of us are using backgrounds, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I what think, do the rest think, of you think? I, mean, we... so I was going to say, I think one of the things that's going to come out of this is an increased focus on the storytelling, right? I think I think it's been very in, very easy for the TV industry with its big infrastructure, big, you know, beautiful studios, expensive cameras to get very caught up in the technology of it. And I think what what this year has shown us is what the audience really appreciates is great storytelling um, and, and, and the ability to relate to the to the news, particularly in, in my case. Uh, and, and I think there's going to be a much bigger focus on that over over coming years. Amaya, are we going to see more more done on mobile phones and more sort of from a camera perspective that uh, that looks different from what we would expect on the linear broadcast? I think we are. I think you know, as we get grounded with lockdowns, you know, who knows how long? Hopefully, not that much longer. But we've relied on UGC, user-generated content, to, uh, for people to film at home. When we do profiles on farmers who aren't making enough money, we ask them to uh, record on their own phones and tell us, walk, give us video diaries. Um, really, you know, get those people stories. And on UGC, using UGC, it really is more powerful and more effective storytelling that we've never done before. You don't need a camera crew to go down all the time. The phone is just incredible. The lenses and cameras itself, I mean, uh, it's just pushed barriers. We have our own correspondence uh, on their phones being uh, live on their phones from a particular point. I think we're going to find, um, you know, news to be a bit more streamlined. Um, you know, we've learned again on the Anderson Cooper Full Circle, you don't need a control room, a traditional control room. You don't need all those bodies in there. And, um, and, and you know, it's that authenticity we're talking about. I think people want to see our talent and people in the field as real human beings, and they get to see that now than ever before. Which is ground, which is great, and then and it makes it more uh, watchable. Mm -hmm. Where do the rest of you see more permanent changes to digital workflow, more streamlined changes, perhaps happening in a post-pandemic world? Well, well, speaking for the digital teams, um, you know that most of that work has always been uh, able to be done remotely. Uh, so, you know, this is just in a lot of ways a reinforcement of that. Um, I think that uh, that for everyone else who, who's really not been used to do, working that way, um, there are just efficiencies. Um, there, there are things that are easier to do. Um, you know, I, I, when I was in a television newsroom, which is, goes back a little ways now, um, you know, I used to lament, like, why is this person coming back in the building? Why? Uh, they can they can do a lot of this stuff remotely. Why are they coming? And and now it's like they can't, and and it's the realization is there uh, that I don't have to, and in a lot of cases I don't want to, uh, because it's going to be faster now. And so you know those are all uh, key key things that have changed. One thing that you know I one of the things. Go ahead. One thing I think is it's interesting um, that. You know, it doesn't directly bear on your question, but you know, we've all spent a bunch of years trying to export things from television to mobile devices. I mean, that was the beginning of, hey, we got a mobile device, let's put TV on it. 
Um, <laughs> and, and now I think we're kind of going to be working on the opposite, which is like, let's take some of the functionality that's on mobile devices and try to apply it to a device that, you know, doesn't have a lot of the capabilities that mobile devices have. You know, it doesn't, it's not as good with location. It's, it's yeah. not as portable. It's, there are a number of limitations, but, but I think people are, are used to the sort of mobile storytelling piece and bringing that to television, despite the, the hardware limitations of, of television sets is gonna be super important. Can it make the visual leap in a in a way that's convincing that that satisfies the expectations of a TV viewer who has maybe more uh, a different set of production values in mind there and, and mobile can't quite meet those? I, I think and you guys are all in the middle of this right now. There's going to be a ton of experimentation and uh, people are going to try a hundred things and three of them are going to work and everybody else is going to jump on that bandwagon and. And it'll it'll happen, um, but it um, and and I think some of that will be that mobile devices and television sets will be paired um, from a technology standpoint more effectively, so that some of those capabilities like location and and others can be shared, um, and that that's something that really hasn't happened a whole lot, but but will happen more as we go forward. When and we I were uh, on expectations as well. So I mean, there's an, ex an example from the BBC a, a little while ago where one of my colleagues wanted to show the power of of mobile telephony and uh, worked out this 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 rig that gave him stabilization, put a proper microphone on it, uh, and filmed a piece for the BBC's flagship ten o'clock news. It went out. He asked the editor, "Hey, what you know? What, what do you think of the camera work on my piece? Oh, God, great camera work! Great camera work! That was filmed on my mobile phone." horror from the editor why didn't you tell me that <laughs> it's what you're expecting is a lot as, as a large part of is, is mobile good enough for a tv audience mm -hmm. right we we're, with just the, the the little time we have left a couple of things one thing that came up when we were preparing for this panel and talking um we got a little bit into audience behavior and the way that audiences uh look and scan channels on streaming versus what they do on linear. And there's much more intentionality, it seems, um, with viewers looking for something very specific on streaming than when they're more casually uh, flipping channels. Do you see, with your audiences, are you noticing a shift? Is there a mindset change that is starting to happen in a confluence of those behaviors or the, where they're not so siloed behaviors and the intentionality perhaps or or the, the browsing nature is different on them? Um, digital and streaming? Well, from, from my perspective, uh, most of the consumption is still very purpose-driven. So I'm looking for X and I'm gonna go digging and I'm gonna go find X. Uh, what I think is interesting is sort of the emergence of almost cable-like experiences or, or, or really essentially cable-like experiences from, from things like Pluto and Tubi and, and things like that where uh, you know, it's the introduction of, I've got this streaming device on and I don't know what to watch. Let me go to this guide that now has a grid of programs. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it feels in a, in a way a step backwards because, you know, the, this new device was supposed to take us away from all of that. But uh, sometimes, and I do this myself, I'll find myself sort of mindlessly consuming content that way. And I think uh, you know, the key is to figure out uh, how to get audiences to come to you through both avenues. Mm -hmm. That's going to be, yeah. Um, one question I want to be sure to put to each of you, just looking ahead to 2021. Um, what's one tool or technology that each of you see as being indispensable to your production process? And, and what's uh, kind of the flip side of that? What is one product that you'd like to see that isn't yet available that you'd like to see vendors producing? Let's start with John there. Oh boy. Um, I mean, I, th I think one of the big things that that we're wrestling with all the time is just the, the idea of how might we hyper personalize, hyper automate, and what can help us uh, in trying to pull data points out and produce, help us more quickly and efficiently produce content around those data points. Um, I'm not sure that's been fully tackled yet. And so we're, we're very, very interested in, in that. Okay. Amanda? You know, 
my answer is I just I don't think there's just one tool. I think what we've learned is the importance of being able to interact with our viewers and audience and like I said, being live and interacting. And I don't think there's one piece of technology that can do that. In production, I feel like we're constantly, we, have, we constantly have discussions about how users have been pushing both live and interactivity. Take Instagram, for example, you know, people can go live at a moment's notice and comment on it, have discussions and have that forum and be, in, be very present and react to things. And, um, you know, it's the stories as well. They can share stories and it's all very immersive and um, they can take content, share it and have a conversation. So. I think a feature along those lines is something I'm interested in and I think would be very powerful. And just really quickly, uh, uh, Robert. Uh, well, I would agree with that last uh, answer, but I would, I suppose, uh, strictly speaking in terms of the BBC, I think transcription technology, speech to text is going to be absolutely vital because for anyone, mm -hmm. uh, any organization that's got a huge amount of, uh, of, broad, of audio video content, under, you can't understand it until you've transcribed it. You can't start running AI and, and concept extraction across it until it's turned into text. So that's going to be a really big push for the BBC over the next 12 months. Uh, in terms okay. of what I'd like from a vendor, um, something that would help journalists write better. <laughs> 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 which, which sounds silly, but actually that's something we're spending a lot of time thinking about is, you know, we are striving for authenticity, striving for casualness, and we're also striving for accuracy and getting the facts right and good storytelling. And that's really hard to do. So, you know, is there any machine help we can give to hard pressed journalists to, to give them a, a hand up in that? Okay, with just seconds left, Glenn. Uh, I'd say a wish list thing is, is just the ability to easily spin up and distribute video content as quickly and as seamlessly as platforms like Facebook. Um, you know, we've lost, and I don't want to say lost, but a lot of audiences is gravitating to those platforms just because it's so easy, including our own journalists. And so we need to be able to crack that to be able to do that just as easily ourselves. Okay. And of course, Joe, you are producing, you are a vendor here producing for for this industry, so, so can what, what about, can we see from you? Can I from? ask for something from customers? Go, go for Is it. <laughs> Take that as a yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I mean, in terms of two technologies, I, I think AI and cloud are, are are the two I would choose for obvious reasons. Um, one thing, and this is probably not what people are expecting, but as you point out, we are a vendor, so we can't ask for anything from vendors, but um, we think there's tremendous opportunity um, to monetize weather um, content better. Um, and, you know, as part of the weather company, we have a lot of resources that are, you know, aimed in that direction. So we'd love to find ways to partner with, with our customers um, around not just content creation, but also monetization. Okay, excellent. And we have come to the end of our allotted time. So I would like to thank Amaya, Glenn, Robert, John, and Joe for a great conversation. Thanks all. Thanks to all of you for being here and good luck to you with your work next year. Thank you. Thank you so much.